At the conclusion of Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, a provisional statement about post-Edwardian approaches to character construction that has metastasized over the years into something of a manifesto for modernist aesthetics, Virginia Woolf urges her audience as follows, quote, you should insist that Mrs. Brown is an old lady of infinite capacity and infinite variety, capable of appearing in any place, wearing any dress, saying anything, and doing heaven knows what. But the things she says and the things she does and her eyes and her nose and her speech and her silence have an overwhelming fascination, for she is, of course, the spirit we live by, life itself." Unquote. I won't rehearse all the ways in which she faults Arnold Bennett for his approach to Mrs. Brown, except to note that she thinks he cheats. Rather than looking directly at Mrs. Brown and staying with her and her thoughts and impressions and psychological musings, he diverts to her clothes, her family home, the landscape passing by outside the train, and the price of various goods and supplies. And he then implicitly invites his reader to supply this context, this infrastructure, this external environment with the woman, the Mrs. Brown, who lives there. So Bennett cheats when it comes to character, she says. He makes his readers do all the hard work, and that assiduous labor is demanded by an author who cheats Mrs. Brown of, quote, infinite capacity and infinite variety, reducing her to her surroundings and social context and missing an opportunity, a supremely humanist opportunity, I would say, of excavating her consciousness for what it can convey of a human nature that is fundamentally fulsome, capacious, complex, and compelling. I will leave it to folks who know Bennett's work far better than I do to decide if these accusations are fair, whether in regard to particular works or to a large portion of his oeuvre. I'm afraid I'm unqualified to judge, but what I want to do today is to argue not so much that they are unfair to, but rather inappropriate to Reisman's steps. And that, in fact, Reisman's steps might be read as a simultaneously healthy and unhealthy corrective to Wolf's assumption that Mrs. Brown is, well, there for the taking. I will stray into some other matters along the way, and I also won't forget to talk a bit about the James Tate Black Prize in fiction, um, and as was mentioned, this is the centenary of, of Bennett having won that. But my primary focus today will be on the idiosyncratic character of Henry Earl Forward and the various ways both he and his narrative construction by Bennett defy some of the certainties and authorial prerogatives of Wolf's essay. To be even plainer, I want to suggest that with the figure of Henry, and to some extent Violet and Elsie as well, Bennett had a very different project in mind. Less the mining of an infinitely complex character than the imaginative delineation of a man who doesn't want to be mined, and of a miserly mind, obsessively devoted not to yielding forth, but to holding back, hoarding, and heavily investing in a state of hidebound self-possession. If you will permit me a moment of anagrammatic experimentation, consider that within the name Riceyman, a name Earl Forward can't even, doesn't even embody, we have three words that say a lot, but also very little, about Earl Forward's character. Iceman, and icy man, and anemic. <laughs> we might think of the R, None of those anagrams had the R in it, right? We might think of the R as that which remains, and indeed remain is another anagram of Riceyman. But the R is very little to work with, and I would be inclined in any case to speak of it as a remainder that the novel works with, but regards necessarily as that reserve or recessive tendency that keeps Henry from coinciding with any appellation bestowed upon him, except maybe miser, which incidentally is almost an anagram. Consider also that first bit of Wolf's peroration. Quote, you should insist that she is an old lady of infinite capacity and infinite variety. Before I go on, by the way, one thing I love about Wolf's essay, and that I have written about elsewhere, is its focus on old age. I sometimes think critics overread this essay along the lines of all character and all characters, when she really has in mind a feminist commitment to the complex lives and ideas of older women who are far too often converted to predictable types or reduced to the most banal, innocuous, and desexualized stereotypes. But back to Henry. Would we think of him as a middle-aged man of infinite capacity and infinite variety? 
I don't think so. Would we say he's capable of appearing any place? Capable, I suppose, but let's remember one of his few departures from the cloistered shop that doubles as his home, the honeymoon whose horrors include but are also symbolized by Madame Tussauds. Worth seeing these horrors, too, as prefigurations of the waxy figures he and Violet, another character who won't be able to live up to her name, will soon become. Would Henry be found, quote, saying anything and doing heaven knows what? Hardly. We know exactly what we would find him doing. Working, limiting his nourishment to a bit of bread and butter, counting his stash of gold and silver, monitoring Violet's and Elsie's use of fuel, and selling the odd book. And finally, would we see, or do we want to see in Henry, quote, the spirit we live by, life itself? I should hope not, but even if we did, we would have to take a much more limited and cynical view of that human nature Wolf speaks of so rapturously and expansively. Lost my place for a second. <laughs> Henry would take us much closer to Freud's version of a death drive that waxes and wanes and struggles and smuggles into progressive time and personal development a kernel of repetition that takes the individual back and back and back again. One time counting the lucre is never enough. You might say, well, a grim but still supportive take is that he's saving it up for a rainy day, maybe for retirement, maybe for when the communists take over. But there's very little in the novel to encourage that reading. Instead, the emphasis is on saving for saving's sake an extravagant waste through the lens of Keynesian economics that weirdly cuts against the image of him as a mean miser. I'll be saying a bit more momentarily about these thin lines between things in the novel, this kind of two sides of the same coin dynamic. But let me take on one more counter argument very quickly. You could say, well, the Folsom character is not Henry, it's Elsie. And indeed, she is the sole survivor of the sickly house, the one Bennett will write more about later. Where Henry is more like Prufrock, wondering if he dare eat a peach, Elsie chows down on cheese and uncooked bacon, giving full vent, we might say, to the raw appetites concealed beneath the asceticism of Henry and Violet. But even Elsie, we must remember, suffers from, but also from another angle thrives on, the compulsion to repeat, cultivating any number of superstitions about Joe's return and reading and rereading his last letter so repetitively that it begins to disintegrate. It's the meager portion, cheese and raw bacon gorging aside, and it really is a gorge in contrast with Henry, but whether it's actually a gorge, I'm, I'm not sure. But it's with that meager portion that she's able to sustain herself. And in her case, speaking of returns and repetitions, Joe does indeed come back, so diminished that Elsie can carry him up the stairs. Joe suffers from PTSD brought on by serving in the war, where he also apparently has contracted malaria. And insofar as he carries the weight of the world, World War I on his shoulders, Elsie shows us that that weight can be light as a feather. I've been making a number of observations about character, but I now want to show my hand and underline a key cultural and historical context that helps us understand what Bennett is up to and what Wolfe's essay doesn't quite give us the ability to comprehend. You may remember one of the more famous pronouncements of Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, on or about December 1910, human nature changed. Wolf has in mind various social, political, technological, economic, and epistemological upheavals. And of course, she's also being a bit facetious. But in Reisman's Steps, we see Henry provide a different date. This is Henry. The truth is, we haven't been straight since 1914, unquote. For Henry, World War I marks the beginning of something that remains unresolved like Joe's malaria, and like the piles of books with nowhere to go on the stacked shelves. Things have piled up, both physically and emotionally, and one way, but not the only way, to read Henry's obsessive accumulation is as a response to the incalculable losses of the war, and, as Elizabeth Alka's recent scholarship reminds us, to the even more dramatic losses of the influenza epidemic that coincided with the war. 
If Henry can't get enough money, can't squirrel enough away, there's something then unlimited about his avarice that tries to match, only ever asymptotically, the immeasurable loss of the time he has lived through. Freud might attribute his acquisitiveness to melancholia, that is, to unresolved grief, and insofar as melancholia is marked by a certain refusal to grieve, to even acknowledge that something or someone has passed, it is also a refusal of time that manifests in the house's many stopped clocks and broken lamps, as if Henry, from within his pretend precarity and penury, is trying to maintain an eternal present in which there is no time in which loss can occur. Loss he conflates with money. One of his fears about the communists, a fear Prufrock would no doubt share, is that they aren't afraid to push a moment to its crisis. And that's, that's a quote from Prufrock. But what would it be like to inhabit Henry's mind? It's worth mentioning that Bennett uses a number of the same narrative devices as Wolfe to excavate consciousness. Moments of free and direct discourse abound in the novel, although they are used more often with Violet and Elsie than they are with Henry. But if Bennett were to dip into Henry's thoughts, what would we expect to hear? Certainly not Clarissa Dalloway's What a Lark, What a Plunge with its effervescent optimism about a morning of flower shopping, a moment of feminist independence recently echoed in Miley Cyrus's best-selling lyrics, I Could Buy Myself Flowers. Of course, not everything in Mrs. Dalloway is cheery. It too has the fog of war hanging over it, and Clarissa's heart condition that requires afternoon rest is attributed directly to a previous bout of influenza. But when she's lying down, where do her thoughts travel? To her childhood at Borton, to that kiss with Sally Seton so rudely interrupted by Peter Walsh, to reveries that nourish her imagination even as her body languishes and she comes to feel so unfair, invisible to a world that cares so little about an aging woman. But Henry? Not so much. Were we to be granted unlimited access to his thoughts, I suspect we would hear something like, did I lock the safe? Did I hide the keys to the safe? Is the gas on? Did Elsie bring the books in? How much money did I make today? How much money did I lose? I hope Violet never makes a steak again. Did I eat too much? Have I gained weight? Is that going to irritate my stomach? Is Elsie in the cheese again? Is Elsie in the bacon? <laughs> Hospitals are expensive. I don't need a hospital. Did I lock the safe? Is my silver enough? Is my gold enough? Are Hilda's bonds still worth anything? In short, Henry's thoughts would not be the stuff of great fiction. They would be repetitive, obsessive, and looped around the great big nothing his compulsions are meant to avoid and disavow, a nothing that he also tries to vanquish with his anorexia, eating nothing, eating the nothing. But you see, I'm psychologizing Henry. I can't help but do so. What's so particular about Bennett's approach is that he doesn't really psychologize. He provides almost no background to Henry's habits, very little in the way of family history, old friends, unrequited loves, etc. And at some level, this approach respects the miser Henry is. In one of her few but memorable outbursts after they are married, Violet asks, why do you keep yourself to yourself? Bennett's narration redoubles and ena enables this keeping, probing Henry's psychology so little that we are well into the novel before we realize the depth of his miserliness and the depth of the impact it has on the woman he has married. Indeed, his miserliness comes to seem less, or not only, a feature of his personality than it does a mood or contaminated air of the house, almost as if it's an airborne pathogen Violet contracts from Henry. My language of pathogenicity might seem odd to you, but we should remember Henry's conviction that the gastrointestinal condition that will eventually kill him was precipitated by his ravenous consumption of the cake Elsie bestowed upon him and Violet as a wedding present. In his mind, he gorged himself, partook too liberally of a rich delectation he would never normally permit himself. And of course, this isn't just any cake. This opening up and gorging, taking in, the alimentary equivalent of his hoarded treasure is associated with the taking of a wife, of taking her in, 
of giving himself over to love's obvious attractions, but a lifelong bachelor who has managed to stay content within the tight parameters of his miserly existence, is Henry cut out for love? Can he hack it? Can he stomach it? Frank Kermode, without really dilating his claim, argued that the wedding cake is the novel's signature achievement. And I think he must have in mind not the layers of the cake, but of subtle meaning folded in and stacked upon themselves as precariously as the stacks of books that occupy the bathroom, stairs, and most crevices of the house. The cake stands in here for a sexual appetite, and the proximity of its consumption to his first night of married coupledom with Violet raises any number of questions about his ability to successfully exercise those appetites. Let me be plainer. I can't not read Henry as a queer character, and I know I risk making too much of his admission that he hasn't been straight since 1914, but there's also the repetitive attachment to Henry of various concerns about his straightness and rightness. When Mrs. Arb, engaged but not yet married, first explores the nooks and crannies of the shop, she experiences it as a dirty and dingy crypt. And of course, she will later accuse Henry of not only obsessing over, but also being a safe. She says to Elsie, this will want some putting straight, if ever it is put straight. To which Elsie replies, and well, you may say it, um, he's always trying to get straight, especially late him. We did get one room straight, upstairs, but it meant letting all the others go. Between you and me, he'll never get straight. Dialogue in this novel often brings these women into collaborative and even collusive intimacy. And here we see them trying to wrangle this bachelor into something like domestic readiness. But all he sees is expense. And as if to manifest physically the expenditure he fears these women are engaging in, he begins to waste, not money, but waste away. Now, some might bristle at my queer reading, and that's fine, but allow me to formulate it somewhat differently. What if some folks, no matter their sexual identity, if they even have a sexual identity at all, simply aren't cut out for love? We like to emphasize love's salvific and energizing effects, and we love to rhapsodize the, ex the ecstasies that attach to falling in love. But do we talk enough about how awful that fall can feel? I'm talking about the feelings of insecurity and anxiety that attend the nagging thought of what if it ends? What if they don't reciprocate? What if they withdraw their affection? What if I love them more than they love me? What if they're pretending? What if they move or die? What if I'm sincere and they are mistaking infatuation for love? We probably also don't talk enough about how hard love can be for the neurodiverse. What does it activate in those already anxious, already obsessive, already anorexic? How might it intensify those tendencies and illnesses? Let's recall the late Tina Turner in What's Love Got to Do With It, where, where the it is so richly unspecified. I've been taking on a new direction, but I have to say, I've been thinking about my own protection. It scares me to feel this way, unquote. With Henry, the wedding cake, the wedding, the marital relationship, it's just too much. He can't handle it. And to repeat myself, we see an unlikely echo of this phenomenon in Elsie, for whom Joe's letter becomes, quote, a talisman, a fetish, unquote. All she can do is read it over and over, and while Joe's absence is prolonged, the same repetition can apply to any length of absence in a lover. Will he come back? Does he still love me? Am I becoming unlovable, untouchable? Where he loves me, he loves me not, is like the Fort Da game described by Freud, an almost infantile mechanism for managing and calibrating loss, for trying to get a sense of control inside of an emotional storm. I'm not saying Henry entertains precisely these concerns, although by novel's end, he does have a real fear after Violet dies that Elsie will abandon him. No, Henry's compulsions are not as relatable as that. His go straight to hoarding, straight to starving, straight to a self-harm that reminds us falling can feel like falling off a cliff. Maybe the lesson of Riceyman's steps is that love's not for everyone. 
Maybe some people do better leading an entire life at low flame. Maybe some people need pleasure meted out so carefully and sparingly, so miserly, that it barely feels like pleasure at all. Maybe those steps are reminders of that meeting, that gradation, that need to regiment existence, especially if one is, and here no negative implication attaches, an Iceman. What I have been suggesting is that Bennett does Henry a real justice, because there are a lot of Henrys out there in the world, maybe more than we realize, and maybe there are some of us here who are more like Henry than we'd care to admit, or that we'd even have the capacity or self-awareness to admit. Bennett doesn't try to excavate his deep thought or sail the provocative currents of his mind because they aren't there. Whether because they never were or because the effects of trauma are such that any such reverie has been blunted, annulled, rendered impossible from the get-go. Bennett accords that trauma some respect. He accords this shut-down person some privacy, and yet he still manages to make him a major character in a novel. Is this realism? I think so, but it's not a realism we necessarily care to tarry with for long. We'd prefer Wolf's psychological realism of a mind energetically engaged with its history, its impressions, it ho its hopes, its disappointments. Henry just wonders if the gas is on and if he ate too much. So I'll stop now talking about Riceyman's Steps uh, and admit to you that when I was reading it again and I was thinking about all those books piled up in the shop, it reminded me of what it's like to judge the James Tate Black Prize. Uh, and, and I mean that. Many of you will know probably that student numbers at universities like the University of Edinburgh have risen in recent years. And so the room that we used to have to store submissions in was taken away from us so that it could be used for office space. And so what that means is the three or 400 submissions that we get a year for the prize now stack up in my office. And uh, it's definitely a health and safety violation. I've, I've tried to make that argument to get more space. Um, but when I was reading the novel, I was very much thinking about, you know, Henry's idea of, well, this looks like a mess to you, but I know where a book is. I can put my hand on one. And that's, that's how I am. I'm like, you can't touch anything in here because then I won't know where it is. So I want to tell you a little bit about the history of the prize, and uh, it's already been pointed out that Riceyman Steps uh, won in the fourth year of the prize, and the James Tate Black Prize is the oldest uh, prize in the UK. Um, and one of the things that it has developed a reputation for, intentionally or not, is bestowing the award to unlikely or unexpected winners. And I think that there were a lot of people at the time that were surprised that, that, that Bennett won. Um, and of course, the way some scholars read that now is that Ricey Man Steps was like his comeback book, right? It sort of brought him back into the critical fold. And I think that's something that the James Tate Black Prize has had at its heart for a hundred years, is a commitment to not necessarily following a fad. You know, there, there are other book prizes that try to stay right on top of what's trendy and sexy and hot, and that's all great. I mean, I, I think there's, there's a real value to that. But we always have tried to avoid that. And in fact, one of the ways we avoid that is by coming very late in the cycle. So most book prizes announce before we do. And we don't select a winner until the year is done. So what that means is that some of the flashy titles have already won the award. And so we're then able to think more about literary merit. We're able to think more about independent publishers. We're able to think about books that we think are fantastic but haven't necessarily gotten the recognition that they deserve. And so in many ways, I think Bennett and Ricey Men's Steps were kind of that initial trumpet call that set the identity for the prize and, and has really held that identity um, up until the present day. That being said, the way that the prize has been judged has changed significantly over the years. So when the prize started, there was a professor at the University of Edinburgh, um, Grierson, and Grierson himself 
decided the winner every year. He just declared it, right? There, there was no process, there was no submission, there weren't eight administrative staff having to send eight million emails every year uh, to publishers, right? He just basically read some stuff and then said, what will I give the prize to uh, this year? And he held the most senior rank at the University of Edinburgh, and that used to be the way that the prize was judged. Whoever held the highest rank, often that would be the person who was the Regius Professor of English, then that person had the right to declare it. Um, the prize was at that time not based at the University of Edinburgh, um, but an Edinburgh professor was the one who would select the winner. What has happened in more recent years is that the prize has become embedded in the university. And we see that as a real strength of the prize that again helps us to maintain some of that integrity around literary merit, about rewarding unexpected or unpredicted accomplishments. So what now marks the prize as being so distinct, so it's the oldest prize, but it's also the only literary prize that is judged out of a university. And not just out of a university, but with student involvement. We see student voice as being integral to the prize. And uh, what we do every year is that we take all those submissions and we have doctoral students who help me to read them. And we slowly narrow down the list to four shortlisted works. For many years, what would then happen is that the judge would select the winner from those four. I'm fundamentally democratic in my values and I didn't like that when I took over. And I said, no, I don't wanna pick the winner. So what we do now is we have a three hour seminar where anywhere between eight and 14 doctoral students sit down with me, occasionally a master's student, and we talk for three hours about the four shortlisted works. And at the end of that, we select a winner and they select. I only vote if there's a tie. Uh, otherwise, I allow their decision to stand. And I think it gives the prize a real kind of integrity that many prizes lack because we're incredibly transparent about how we do things. There have been some controversies that you might be aware of in recent years where it was discovered after the fact that there were judges who hadn't even read books that won the prize, right? You know, and we really want to avoid that kind of um, uh, ledger domain. And so we really try hard to keep things, uh, uh, to keep things transparent and driven by student involvement. But I think also, and I'll kind of finish with this point before we open it up for questions, I think also something that we're very keen to do is to kind of move away from a laser-like focus on the winner. And so the other thing that has changed since Bennett won is that there is now a short list. Every year there are four. And there are four for fiction and there are four for biography. We're also the only literary prize that has fiction and biography together. And Bennett, I think is someone who in his own time would have wanted a celebration of the writing community at large. Yes, for sure, he was a successful writer. He cared a lot about being successful, well-read, you know, financially uh, well remunerated and all of that. But Bennett also had a strong commitment to other writers of his time, celebrating their work, praising their work, encouraging them, in some cases supporting them, right? And that's the other model that we're trying to carry forward is yes, there will always be a winner and that winner will always always get 10,000 pounds. And of course that amount is worth less every year, right, in a certain way. But in terms of the events that we do, we're trying to uh, have a focus on all the shortlisted writers and have it be a celebration of great writing in a particular year, not just a celebration of the winner. And so I wanna end with an invitation to you all because this is the Arnold Bennett Society. You all, the, you all are the members and uh, we recently got uh, an anonymous donation from someone that is uh, allowing us to do more programming around the prize. So historically, we've only been able to do one event per year, and it's the prize event at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. But going forward, we're going to be able to do more events on campus. And that excites us because one of the problems with doing a single event at the book festival is that you don't get much involvement from students because it's in August and they've all gone home 
and all of their flats have been rented out for 10 times the price for the Fringe Festival, right? And so we really want more students around, and this money is going to allow us to bring speakers, writers, previous winners of the prize, scholars focused on previous winners of the prize to do lectures for us, to do master's classes with students and so on. So if, if any of you all have ideas, uh, people you think we should bring, definitely let us know. The other thing that that money is doing is it's setting up a James Tate Black archive, which has never existed. Um, and, and I have to say that I was somewhat shocked when I took over as judge because, you know, I wanted to know more about the history of it. There is no history of it if what we mean by history is written down, stored, archived, uh, and, and all of that. There's stuff here and there. And that's another invitation I wanted to put to you. If you know something about Bennett winning the prize, and it could be something minor, it could be a letter, it could be a postcard, it could be, you know, definitely reach out to me because that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to store right now. We're trying to digitize it and we're trying to create a space where if a scholar wanted to come study the prize, they could come to Edinburgh University and undertake a research project within our library. So those are the invitations that I put to you, but I will end there and I'm happy to take any and all questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Wonderful. Uh, if you do have a question, I'll come to you with this so we can uh, all hear what you ask, uh, Benjamin. Any, does anyone have a first question? Can I just ask how much did Bennett actually win? That is a good question. It wouldn't have been £10,000, no. Uh, so it has been scaled up over the years. I think, but I could be wrong about this, that it was several hundred pounds that Bennett won, I think. Yes. Who was James Tate Black? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> um, he was a businessman, right? So he was not an, uh, an academic, but he was an avid reader. And when he died, his wife, and, and in many ways, the, the prize is in his name, but it was actually his wife that did all the heavy lifting around getting it set up. Uh, Janet Coates Black um, was the one that actually set the award in his name. Um, and he was an avid reader, and so when he died, she wanted to take part of their um, savings, uh, part of their, the money, and, and dedicate it to a celebration of writing. And uh, the other thing I should say that's changed about the prize over the years is that in its earliest years, um, the, the work had to be published in the UK. And, and, and at that point, it meant largely uh, British writers were, were considered for it. It's become much more international over the years. So we have um, uh, many American writers who have won, Australian, um, and recently as well, writers from India, Nigeria, and so on. In the last three years, we have also begun to open the prize up to translations. Um, so we do see the future of the prize as being increasingly cosmopolitan, international. Um, but when it was originally set up, it was mainly as a, a celebration of British writing. And one of the things I told you that there's so little about the history of the award that I struggled with when I took over is that I wanted to know things like, well, can we change X? You know, can, can we do something different? And, and there were people who were like, no, you can't do that. You know, and, and I found out that actually it was pure precedent. There was nothing ever written down about how the prize was supposed to be run, except that there was supposed to be a winner. That, that was it. And, and, th and that's, that's sort of what I mean is that when Bennett won, it was just out of the blue, right? It was just a declaration by the most senior professor at Edinburgh this is the winning novel, right? And so, of course, nothing was written down in the sense that there was no procedure. And I doubt that Grierson himself would have wanted to, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have accounted for how he came to that conclusion. And his one quote about Ricey Men's Steps is something as throwaway as a jolly good novel or something like that, you know. So university life has changed over the years and what it means to be an authority and how you convey that authority has changed. I will say that the, um, the other interesting thing about Bennett's place in the prize and Bennett's relationship to modernism is that Grierson himself was not 
a, a, a scholar of modernism. He mainly wrote on earlier periods, and when he was reading Bennett and declaring Bennett the, the winner, he was actually writing a book on Byron at the time. Um, and so that's an interesting thing to think about, right? That he, even though this is 1923, this is a major year, right? You know, you've had the wasteland, you've had Ulysses, you have Virginia Woolf about to publish this essay, Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown. So very much, you know, a modernist um, uh, whirlwind, but I don't actually think that um, Grierson cared that much. I, I really don't. I don't think he was reading anything that he was looking at through the lens of modernism. I think he was thinking of it more as great literature reaching back for hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's, that's another thing is that I think even at that moment, the prize had an identity of not trying to be in fashion or trying too hard to be in fashion. And on winning the prize, did it carry any kind of commitment, any kind of follow-up to uh, write something, announce something, do something? And does it ca carry any kind of follow-up today? Uh, no. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is because, well, it, I think in its earliest uh, conception, nobody thought about that. And that probably has a little bit to do with the fact that when Bennett won it, it wasn't based at the university. So, it, and there was also no Inter Edinburgh International Book Festival, right? So in a sense, there was no platform on which to stage future kinds of events. And that's the thing we've been trying to work on recently is like, how do we get previous winners of the prize more engaged with the prize now? And that's one of the things that this donation is going to allow us to do. And I should say too, this is one of those forward donation, so it will go on forever. It's written into this person's uh, will, uh, and, and we'll be able to bring previous winners back. We might be able to have events where they interview later winners, um, you know, so we're really excited about the future of the prize. But no, historically, there's been no expectation uh, of previous winners. Thank you. Uh, could I just say how very much I enjoyed listening to the whole of that? Thank you. <clears throat> particularly your... Um, reading of it as um, a queer novel in parts, and could I just make the observation on that point that perhaps you'd like to look at a novel like Imperial Palace, mm. okay, where there's a Paris nightclub scene which I think you might find interesting in, times, in terms of gender fluidity. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, um, how often do you look back at that list of winners and ask yourself, should one of these, or two or three of these, be on the contemporary reading list for Edinburgh University? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a really good uh, question, and uh, I, I, first I want to thank you for the suggestion. As many of you probably know, I'm not a, a Bennett scholar. I haven't published on Bennett before. Um, I have published on Wolf, and so you probably got a bit of that flavor in the talk. Uh, but, um, but I want to read more, Bennett, and in fact, your invitation to have me here has sort of set my resolution to read more Bennett, and, and, and I have a lot to read. Um, absolutely. So what we might, in a kind of admin speak, think of as the curricularization of the prize is something I'm very intent on doing, right? I, I think, I, you know, I realize this is being recorded, so I'm imagining some senior administrator uh, scolding me later for saying this. I don't think the university has been very strategic about the prize uh, over the years. I think that there's been a kind of fumbling, making do with it from year to year because it's obviously such a major undertaking. The number of submissions we get, winnowing that down to a short list, selecting a winner, that that more expansive forward thinking just hasn't been there. And it's something that I'm very keen to do. Uh, and I, I really want some of the prize winners stretching back to, you know, the very first winner, uh, D.H. Lawrence, uh, or to, uh, you know, um, other early writers to be something that we do teach at Edinburgh. And that might take the form of um, uh, a course that we would offer that would be sort of the history of the prize and the people who won it or it could just be taking some of those works and putting them into the core reading lists for our first and second year courses one thing that I, I, I won't be able to walk out of here today without advertising to you is the online class that goes with the prize which is called how to read a novel and it's free uh, and it runs every August 
and it also runs, it reruns in January. So we do two runs of this online course. We've had over 70,000 people take it in the last six years um, from all over the world. And it's, I think it's a really great class. Now I have to say that to you because I organize it, right? But, but, but I, didn't, I didn't start it though. And the online course is meant to be a kind of back to basics for people that want a kind of intro to literary study. So there's a week on plot, there's a week on character, there's a week on dialogue, and there's a week on setting. And for each week, one of the shortlisted works from this year's prize is used to explore those different features. Um, so we're really trying to use the online course to promote the prize and vice versa. And one of the things that I, I, I want to do going forward is when we are teaching students the building blocks of literature, you know, what is dialogue? How do you do dialogue? that we are using more examples from previous winners. Because right now, if you go and you look at the online course and you go to study character, let's say, um, you know, we're not really using prize winners to do that, except the current one, right? But we're not using previous winners. And so I think we have kind of two fronts. And I, I was saying uh, to someone earlier that I've already made the resolution uh, to put Riceyman steps on one of our courses in fall 2024. I teach a class called Modernist Aesthetics at Edinburgh for master's students. And uh, so I think in 2024, we're going to put Riceyman steps there, you know, around week two or week three or something like that, uh, because it gets, it gets fatiguing to read the same things over and over again. So uh, I love Virginia Woolf, but I'm tired of teaching Mrs. Dalloway, so. Uh, <laughs> There was some question about how much Benny was paid. Yeah. I can confirm that um, he wrote when he got the prize, this took my breath away and the check was £112. <laughs> what, I really, what I really wanted to say was you didn't mention that the first winner was none other than Hugh Walpole for his very splendid novel, The Secret City. Yeah. Uh, and um, I'm rather dismayed. Those of us in the Hugh Walpole Society <laughs> thought it was because it was a super novel. Um, what you say about Grierson's selection rather knocks that on the head. Um, <laughs> and you'll know, of course, that uh, Hugh Walpole was sort of almost like a disciple to, um, to, to Bennett in their relationship. And um, when Bennett won, Walpole wrote to him, heartiest congratulations on winning a prize. I'm sure it will be disappointing to you that I have also won it. <laughs> but never mind, you've now wiped out that disgrace. <laughs> Bennett replied the same day, in very much a Bennettian way, very many thanks. The fact is, I never heard of the prize before. <laughs> Thank you. And, and it's worth bearing in mind, right, that it, it takes a while for a prize to form an identity. And so I'm, I'm not surprised at all that Bennett hadn't really heard of it or thought about it or, you know, um, I, it was probably 30, 40 years into the prize before it had a name recognition. I was kind of wondering about that. Um, the, uh, the idea of literary prizes, was it kind of imported from France, perhaps? Or did, um, how, how's it... Um, how did uh, the whole idea of literary prizes start? It, you know, that's, that's an excellent question, and there are several ways to answer that. That you're right, there had been ones in France that preceded. Um, I also see it as being very much about the war uh, and uh, sort of a spirit of uh, nationalism, national pride, patriotism that sprang up. A lot of literary prizes did form in the early 20th century and I think it was a way of affirming the cultural value of things. It was a way of celebrating, you know, authors that, that, that a country was proud of. Um, the U.S. began to set up literary prizes around that time as well. A lot of controversial things won prizes around that time. So one author that I work on a lot is Willa Cather. I don't know if you all know her, the American novelist. Um, Cather's novel, One of Ours, won the Pulitzer in 1921. And it was really controversial then uh, because many people thought 
this isn't a great novel, it's not our favorite Cather novel, it's a bit jingoistic and so on. I think that's a misreading of that novel, but it speaks about how caught up literary prizes were in these national and international <laughs> dynamics of the time. You know, does this novel celebrate our values? Does it say something distinctive about Britain or the US or whatever? And, I, and so I don't think it's a coincidence that a number of these prizes got going during a time when national identities were being redefined, reconsolidated, Dated and so on. Thank you very much for your uh, yes, that talk, Benjamin. I really enjoyed it. I think it opened <laughs> up uh, multiple windows on different uh, aspects of uh, the novel, which uh, will start me uh, thinking. Um, one in particular that I found interesting was uh, your comment about the year 1914 mm -hmm. and, and the indirect reaction um, to the uh, First World War and also the flu epidemic, potentially, uh, possibly. Um, and I think you know, also in, refer in relation to your comments on Mrs. Dalloway, that, would, that seems probably to apply to that as well. I can think of another example, Mary Webb's novel Gone to Earth. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether you, 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 there's that sort of indirect reaction to major historical crises um, Occurred in, has occurred in where other sort of crises were, were involved, in particular the Second, the Second World War. Uh, and I'm also thinking now of the current uh, events that we've just experienced with the flu, the, the, the COVID pandemic. So I wonder whether you have any thoughts on, on that subject. Yeah, absolutely. And a book that I would definitely recommend to you is, uh, I mentioned it very briefly, Elizabeth Alka's book, Viral Modernism. Uh, she published that book in 2019. <laughs> and it, you know, like all academic books, it was well regarded, but it wouldn't necessarily have been something that would have become well known. Um, but she published it right before COVID started. And, and, and the argument of viral modernism is that we have overplayed the impact of World War I on modernism um, in terms of those themes, right, of, of, of PTSD, uh, morbidity, um, uh, alienation, grief, loss, that, that uh, I, I, I know Elizabeth, so I'm, I'm going to call her Liz to you. Liz argues that, that actually um, the pandemic that spread, was spread over three years, right, from 1918 to 1920, was far more devastating. More people died of the Spanish flu than died of uh, th than died in the war uh, from from direct wounds. Uh, and she does these amazing readings of texts like The Wasteland, where she says people have always read this in terms of war trauma, but actually a lot of these metaphors are 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 flu. Related. So if you think about um, the drowned sailor in the wasteland, Liz reads that as being a metaphor for lungs filling up with water for the um, cytokine storms that were set off by the Spanish flu. Because one of the big differences between COVID and the Spanish flu is that COVID largely, although not exclusively, impacted groups that we already thought of as being vulnerable, older people, immunocompromised people. That was not the case with the Spanish flu. It was most deadly for the very healthy. The better your immune system was, the worse off you were because it turned your immune system against itself and set off these cytokine storms. So the very people that were dying in the war, the young, the healthy, were also dying of this at the same time. You also have those mentions in the wasteland about all the bodies that have been buried out back. And Liz says, you know, those wouldn't have been war bodies. Those were the bodies of family members that were dying of the flu during those years. And the, the, the crematoriums were piling up with bodies and people were actually burying bodies in backyards and near, nearby places that they could. So I think that's really, really important. I think we will see far more novels about COVID going forward. There are already some that are being written. Uh, I want to say that that most recent Sally Rooney novel has references to the lockdown uh, in it. So we're going to see a big wave of literature about COVID. Another one that I would put out there that I'm currently working on is HIV AIDS and the literature that emerged after that. It's hard sometimes because, and this is something I, I tried to convey in the talk, 
in many ways, you are always forced into a kind of speculation. Because if you say, well, there are these big historical traumas that are happening, war, a pandemic, and so on, and then you get a character like Henry, I want to psychologize. I want to say, look, this could stem from X, Y, and Z. But of course, that information would not be present to Henry. His inability, from the very get-go, he would not be able to think that way because that's what trauma does. It blunts, right? You know. So in some ways, what I see Bennett is doing in this novel is saying, I'm going to give you a character that is so shut down but I'm not gonna open him up because if I open him up, he's not shut down anymore. I'm not doing justice to him in that shut down state. And that's what he's trying to accomplish here. And I think he does it really beautifully, actually. It might not feel beautiful. It might not be a pleasure to read. Uh, Carol said to me last night about Rice Eatman's Steps, it's a dark novel, right? I mean, it is. It's probably not the most pleasurable one to read over and over again. But I think it succeeds at something really well. It succeeds at a kind of morbid state of mind um, and it doesn't really try to speculate where that comes from. And I think there's something kind of nice about that, that Bennett's not interested in fixing him in some kind of way. Yes, uh, thank you very much, mm -hmm. Edwin, for your, both your talks. Really very interesting. Um, you, you said that uh, Arnold Bennett doesn't give a, a psychological insight into Henry. And I'm taking, you mean by that self-awareness, his own inner dialogue. And at the far end, we have um, Virginia Woolf, of course, Mrs. Dalloway, who is nothing but that. So can you just comment briefly on who you might place a, a, a contemporary of Bennett in the middle of those two extremes? And for instance, are you, are you then, sorry, this is a bit twofold, this question, are you then defining Henry as simply a miser as per George Eliot's uh, Silas Marner? Again, you don't get any psychological breakdown of Silas, but you know why he's ended up like that. Mm -hmm. but, so it's two things, really. Uh, the, is there someone treading the middle road, in your opinion? And how does Henry compare to Silas Marner in yeah. terms of miserliness? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think, so let me say two things. When I'm talking about psychology, I, yes, I, absolutely, I'm talking about are we in their thoughts? Is there a psychological realism, right? And of course, a lot of people like Virginia Woolf were criticized by um, uh, political scholars of the time. I'm thinking about someone like Lukács who referred to modernism as a flight into psychopathology. He thought that modernism was diverting you to these inner swirls of thoughts that caused you to lose focus on social realities. Um, so I'm thinking about that being inside the mind, but I'm also thinking about something else you said, which is like what fed into this? Like, so what creates psychological depth, even if that depth is inaccessible to the character himself, right? And part of what I'm saying is, is that Riceyman Steps doesn't really speculate on where that comes from. Why is he a miser? Why is he so weird about food? I mean, I do think one way to read this novel is as a novel about anorexia. Uh, and anorexia is very contagious in the sense that people can learn it from each other. That's why we don't see a lot of representations of it on TV because it's really dangerous actually to show anorexic bodies. It inspires people to go do it, just like we don't see a lot of representations of suicide on TV because it gives people ideas. Um, I, I think this is a novel in many ways about obsessive compulsive disorder, which is highly attached to uh, anorexia, and, and, and that Violet kind of picks it up from Henry in a certain way, right? They become anorexic together. Websites like Facebook, all these, you know, they're constantly having to keep an eye out for these um, pro-ana posts and webs, you know, these, these sub-communities that form. This is a very closed environment in this house, right? And there are a lot of unhealthy behaviors being shared and modeled. So, but, but what I think is so interesting is that, is that Bennett definitely gives us the outcome of that, where it leads, but just doesn't tell us much about how they got there, right? I also, at some level, like to take characters at their word, right? So when Henry says, this all started with the wedding cake, one way to read that is, well, that's absurd, right? You, you don't eat wedding cake and then become a, an anorexic uh, miser or something like that, right? But I kind of think there's truth to that. I mean, part of what I was trying to argue at the end of the talk is that marriage wasn't good for Henry, right? 
the statistics show that marriage usually is good for men. It's not so good for women, and it didn't turn out well for Violet, obviously. Um, but but it's generally good for men. But in this case, I don't think that that Henry has the capacities for love. I think it's too much. I think it shuts him down even further. But again, that's me speculating. That's not ammunition that Bennett really gives me. Um, who's threaded through the middle? Um, one person that comes to mind, since I've already mentioned her, is the American writer Willa Cather. I, I think I think Cather does a lot more of going inside of characters' thoughts and impressions and inhabiting their minds, but not to the extent that Wolf does. Because if you think about what Wolf does, whether you want to call it free and direct discourse or psycho narration or stream of consciousness, Wolf actually tries to break characters down and she creates like a collective thought across them, right? So if you think about that moment from Mrs. Dalloway when the airplane goes over and you have all these different people that are thinking similar thoughts at the same time, uh, the scholar Jennifer Wick has referred to this as telekinesis in, in Wolf, right? It, it, it's an attempt to have a social mind, right? In a way that almost kind of doesn't care about the characters that much. That's one reason that I think Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown is always at risk of being overread, because I'm not actually sure that you see it manifest what she's arguing for. I don't think you see it manifest that well in Mrs. Dalloway or to the lighthouse. I think Wolf actually ends up kind of flattening characters into a network of thought. Whereas I think Cather does stay with characters in a very fundamental way, but she does a bit more with, with the development of psychological depth in those characters. Okay, one last question, Philip. Okay, um, this, this is just because I go to book groups and um, the discussions that we have there are usually totally different from anything I've heard this morning. <laughs> <laughs> You see, most people, it seems to me, when they pick up a novel, they don't look at the word rising and steps and think, ice man. <laughs> and how are steps, you know, important in this novel? They just think that's the title of the novel. We have this time and time and again. I'm just wondering whether, which of the people, you know, they, they when we discuss it, they, they just say, oh, I didn't like him. Oh, he was horrible, he was. They were real people. You see, we never get beyond that. So there must be a mean <laughs> between your approach to these things and the way we read them. And sometimes I wonder whether, if you look at any novel, from you could look at it from a particular point of view and put your own interpretation on it, in, in the way that you know feminist writers may well look at a novel. There's nothing to talk about feminism and find all the feminism. Mm -hmm. Can that happen? Yeah, you, you maybe have offered an explanation of why I don't get invited to book clubs. Uh, I've, I, I don't think I've ever been invited to one, actually, so now you have me thinking about that. Um, no, I mean, absolutely, and, and I think your question is ultimately one about method, right? How do you decide what a book means? Do you locate the meaning in the author's intention? Do you locate the meaning in the way people read it? Do you locate meaning in the text itself? And this is a battle about literary interpretation that's been going on for the last 100 years. Um, the rise of new criticism in the 1950s, for example, was all about centering the text. It was like, get rid of the author. That's the intentional fallacy. Don't care about readers. They're all over the place. You know, it, it, New criticism almost wanted to turn literary criticism into a science of the written word, right? We, we don't do new criticism anymore because one of the other things new criticism didn't want you to do was ever talk about politics, right? It was like, focus on the words. Don't bring in feminism. Don't bring in politics. This was the McCarthy period, right, in the US. That it was like, you know, they didn't want any accusation of being political. Nowadays, we talk about things like gender and disability and sexuality and race all the time. Um, but we still inherited a lot from new criticism with that focus on the words on the page. So people like me, people who did, you know, PhDs in literature in the early 2000s and were trained by the people that were being trained in the 1980s by people like, you know, Jacques Derrida, Paul Demand, whatever, they were like, the way you read a text is you get into those details and you try to do a lot with little things. And that is the way that I'm trained. It's sort of my method is to go to a book and say, 
okay, there are lots of things I could say, but I want to find details that maybe people haven't quite mined before, right? And yet one of the things I hope that I conveyed in my talk is that when I'm mining like that, I'm very aware that at some level I am departing from Bennett's intention, right? Like I'm saying, I want to psychologize Henry, but I also know that Bennett is pulling back and saying, don't do it. He's a miser. Let him be a miser, right? So I was trying to kind of strike that balance between the two things. But absolutely, your question is one about method. And people have different methods. And one of those is deciding, is, are these characters relatable? Do I like them? Are these people that reflect norms and types that I see in my daily life? And that's absolutely fine, I would say. I think that literary interpretation needs to work across different methods, right? There's no need for us to kind of settle on a particular, on a particular one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, really wonderful session there. Thank you very much.